Today, we're going to talk about a staple of the contract law canon, the famous chestnut of Hadley versus Baxendale. In some respects, this may be the case furthest removed from us today. It was decided more than a century and a half ago in 1854 in England. Uh, but the Hadley rule concerning recovery for foreseeable consequential damages is with us today in largely unchanged form. The brothers Joseph and Jonah Hadley owned the city flour mills in Gloucester, England. The crankshaft in the steam engine used to power the mill broke, halting the mill's operation. The Hadleys needed to get the broken crankshaft to the steam engine's manufacturer in Greenwich so that the manufacturer could provide a replacement. The Hadleys sent an employee to the defendant's offices uh, of Pickford and Sons to have them transport the crankshaft to the manufacturer. The Hadley employee and Pickford and Sons agreed that the delivery would be made the following day for a cost of two pounds and four shillings. The employee did not explain that the mill was inoperable due to this broken uh, shaft. But then, because of, quote, some neglect, unquote, the delivery was delayed, and so the mill couldn't run for several more days. The plaintiff sued, arguing contractual breach and seeking damages not only for the amount they paid uh, for the shipping service, but also for their lost profits of having the mill closed. The judge quote, left the case generally to the jury, which awarded a verdict of 25 pounds damages, taking into account the plaintiff's lost profits for the days the mill couldn't run. Does the some neglect on the part of the company that the opinion discusses matter in this action? Not really. There's a strict liability for breach of contractual promises, uh, whether it was intentional, whether it was negligent, even if it was non-negligent, if you don't perform your promises, uh, you have to compensate the other side. The Hadley Court awarded a new trial on the ground that the judge hadn't properly instructed the jury. Baron Adelson, an influential judge, agreed. He announced the rule that parties to a contract are only liable for damages that were foreseeable at the time of contract formation. The court found that damages for breach of contract should be such as may fairly and reasonably be considered either arising naturally from breach of contract itself or such as may reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of both parties at the time they made the contract as the probable result of the breach of it. Did this necessarily mean that the jury's verdict of 25 pound damages was incorrect? Not quite. The court explained that parties could inform each other of unique circumstances that could make the damages of a breach more significant, more foreseeable than they'd be in an ordinary case. If they did so, these more significant damages would still have to be foreseeable. If the special circumstances were communicated by the plaintiff to the defendant and thus known to both parties, the damages resulting from the breach of such a contract, which they would reasonably contemplate, would be the amount of injury which would ordinarily flow from a breach of contract under these special cir circumstances so known and communicated. It's important to understand that the error the court found was not that the jury award was necessarily too big. It was that the judge had failed to explain to the jury that its award had to be limited to foreseeable damages. The court did not rule that a properly instructed jury could not have returned the same damage award. On that note, let's make clear that uh, we understand the difference between direct and consequential damages. One way to differentiate between these damages is to distinguish the damages that are needed to acquire substitute goods or services or their equivalent, which as we just saw uh, last time, might be captured by cost of performance or diminution in value damages. 
So we want to distinguish those damages from the damages flowing from the loss incurred as a consequence or result of the plaintiff not having the promised goods or services, which in this case is the plaintiff's lost profit from not having the mill uh, operable. A rule that says non-foreseeable lost profits, like Hadley, are non-recoverable may seem unfair. Can you think of any reasons why courts might impose this limitation? Well, Baron Adelson's opinion explained, quote, had the special circumstances been known, the parties might have specially provided for breach of contract by special terms as to the damages in this case. And of this advantage, it would be very unjust to deprive them. It, you see, if parties are aware of special circumstances that will expose them to greater liability, they likely will take more care to make sure they perform and charge more for their services. Similarly, if parties know that courts will hold them responsible for damages they could not foresee, they will raise their prices generally to take uh, into account this greater chance that they're going to be tagged for high damages. They'll not be able to tailor their care to customers who need it the most. As a result, customers who only have typical foreseeable damages will have to pay more to help insure customers with atypical damages. Federal Express, FedEx, uh, provides that when shipping packages, quote, unless a higher value is declared and paid for, our liability for each package is limited to $100. Uh, for each package exceeding $100 in declared value, an additional amount will be charged, unquote. That's, that's from the FedEx contract on every FedEx package. Why might this be a better policy for customers than if FedEx did not limit liability for valuable items over $100? Well, it's for exactly the same reason we've just discussed. It makes more sense to require those who might incur substantial consequential losses if their packages are lost or damages to pay more to insure them than to have all those who use FedEx services to foot the bill for others' valuable shipments. And it lets FedEx know when it needs to take special care to get a package through. As we noted at the outset, this was an English case, not an American case, but courts in the United States typically follow the Hadley rule. The Supreme Court at the turn of the century suggested a different path. Justice Holmes asserted in Globe Refining versus Landa Cotton Oil Company that, quote, mere notice to a seller of some interest or probable action of the buyer is not enough necessarily and as a matter of law to charge the seller with special damages on that account if he fails to deliver the goods, unquote. The defendants had to have at least tacitly agreed to be liable for these extra losses at issue. But most courts reject this test. It is enough that the defendant foresaw or had reason to foresee the plaintiff's losses that are being claimed. This is reflected in uh, the Restatement of Contracts, Section 351, which provides damages are not recoverable for loss that the party in breach did not have reason to foresee as a probable result of the breach when the contract was made. Loss may be foreseeable as a probable result of a breach because it follows from the breach, in the ordinary course of events, or B, as a result of special circumstances beyond the ordinary course of events that the party in breach has reason to know. So, is the Hadley rule a default rule or a, a mandatory rule? Now, it's a default rule. Parties can contract around it by giving sufficient notice of special circumstances. Parties can also contract out of the rule in the other direction. They can explicitly exclude all liability for consequential damages. There's usually a, a term excluding liability for consequential damages in most uh, consumer electronics contracts. Uh, Rob Gertner and I have categorized uh, Hadley versus Baxendale doctrine 
as an example of a penalty default or an information forcing default. The court's refusal to award unforeseeable damages uh, uh, is a refusal not because those damages aren't real, but the Do Hadley Doctrine gives promisees an incentive to reveal information to the promisors about what otherwise would be unusual consequential damages. One way to think about cases like Hadley, where breach occurred because of some neglect, is through a torts lens, where the law, among other things, should be trying to induce optimal promise or preca precaution. The risk of non-performance can be thought of as the probability of non-performance, the probability of breach, multiplied by the loss to the promisee, including consequential damages, that will result from non-performance. That's the, the risk can be thought of as the probability times the loss. A standard move in law and economics is to place the risk of loss on the better risk bearer. A good risk bearer will tend to have information and control. Information about the size of the risk and and the control or ability to take action to change that size. And here is the structural problem with regard to contractual risks. Promisers tend to have better knowledge and control about the probability of breach, but promisees tend to have better knowledge and control about the size of loss that will occur, that will result if breach occurs. The shipping company, Pickford, knew more about the probability that the shipment would not be delivered, and it's better place to take action to affect that probability, say by strapping on more horses to the carriage to, to make sure that the shipment goes through even if one of the horses goes lame. The Hadleys, on the other hand, knew more about the size of loss if their, uh, if their factory had to close down and they were better able to control the size of the loss, say by keeping spare crankshafts in stock. So at first glance, it seems difficult to decide whether the promisor or the promisee is the better risk bearer. The promisor has better knowledge and control of one variable, P. The promisee has better knowledge and control of the other variable, L. But the genius of the Hadley rule is that by using an information forcing default, contract law can tip the scales and make the promisor the better risk bearer. By inducing promisees to disclose the size of their loss to the promisor, the Hadley, Hadley rule makes the promisor now better placed to bear this loss, armed with better information about both the probability of breach and now also the size of the breach. Moreover, as we could see from the FedEx example, since promisors are going to respond to Hadley information by charging a higher price uh, when performing for a high damage promisee, the Hadley rule even indirectly gives promisees incentives uh, to exercise their control over the size of the loss to mitigate damages. Some FedEx shippers will find it cheaper to keep extra crankshafts in stock rather than pay the extra insurance that will be required if high prospective damages are disclosed. We have discussed the influence of the Hadley Rule in the United States and the policy concerns that underlay it. We should note another less obvious way Hadley proved influential. Recall where the court in Hadley placed the error that occurred. The jury was not at fault for awarding excessive damages, rather the judge improperly uh, instructed the jury. As the court explained, quote, we deem it to be expedient and necessary to state explicitly the rule which the judge that the next trial ought in our opinion to direct the jury to be governed by when they estimate the damages, unquote. Hadley was decided in an era in which English courts increasingly reformulated questions of fact that had been left previously to the jury's discretion, like damages, as matters of law 
to be judged, to be decided by judges. By making a rule that consequential damages can only be awarded if damages are foreseeable, 